Our next speaker is Margot Fassler, Leo Hesburgh Professor of Music History and Liturgy and co-director of the Master of Sacred Music program at the University of Notre Dame. Medieval art historians have benefited from her ca uh, careful research into music and liturgy. The titles of her books, Virgin of Chart, Making History Through Liturgy and the Arts of 2010, and Gothic Song, Victoring Sequence and Augustinian Reform in 12th Century Paris from 1993, are but two major works from a long list of publications upon which we depend enormously. The title of Professor Fassler's talk this afternoon is The Musical Repertories and Liturgical Context of the Codex Calixtinus, an overview. Margot. Thanks, it's great to be here. Um, I just wanted to say that Giles Constable once told me um, that Lucy was called Mrs. Queensley Porter. <laughs> Um, and I, and I now see, <laughs> I now see how great that would have been. It's also a real pleasure to be the uh, opening act for Lionheart. Um, Richard Porterfield was my student in my first class that I taught at Yale in 1983. So um, for us to be working together is a is a real pleasure. This is as my as my title says. Is this a little bit? Boomy? No? Um, this is an overview. And uh, I'm going to sort of run it like a class, so you'll see all kinds of different features of my PowerPoint and what I've been watching on YouTube and all kinds of interesting things. Um, but, you know, it is a great irony to be uh, working with this particular manuscript because um, so many oftentimes we have manuscripts, and we try to figure out where they're from. And this particular manuscript, we know where it's from, but we try to figure out who made it. So um, it's different in that particular way. It's also uh, a shrine book, and that's a very particular and important kind of book. Um, I'm going to play this uh, slideshow right from the beginning. So, The Shrine Book is a, a creation to make a cult of a saint. And when, when a community creates a book like this, they're writing about their past, and they're making a sense of their identity. And oftentimes, they're doing it so that they can make a place for pilgrims to come and feel that the very extraordinary expense and time that it takes to make that journey is worth it. When you are a medieval historian, you ride uh, in a trolley that goes on two tracks. And one track is uh, the track of the things that happened, or what we might call facts. And the other track is the track that's made up of those things that people wanted to have happened or that they created as a past for themselves. And it's very difficult um, to know the difference many times. And it's also, I think, crucial for those of us uh, who work in the Middle Ages to make the point to those who don't that track one and track two are equally important and that the past which people create or invent is as elegant, um, as complete, uh, as oftentimes the things which actually happened, and many times the past which they create is the most important thing that they do, is indeed more important than things they actually did. And so when we turn to um, a shrine book like this, um, with our own uh, uh, taste for veracity, it's easy for us to laugh at and to dismiss it and think of it as something quaint. But actually, it is a very sophisticated way of making history. It's history that is created 
out of many different elements and that exists in an interdisciplinary sphere, and one which is oftentimes hard for us to understand because we so often detach one small piece of it and, and look at only it. So when we think about this wonderful model that we've been seeing all day and zooming in and zooming out of it and flying all around it as we have been doing, um, we must remember too that it was decorated and painted. It was not a gray monolithic slab of stone. It was entirely different in look even though we're privileged, of course, and it's wonderful to be able to zoom through the spaces. Um, we need to use our imaginations uh, visually. We also need to remember that it's not a silent monolith ever, but that it was filled with all kinds of sound, music and, and noise and um, uh, the quietness of it really bothered me this morning. I wanted to put some sound to the zooms um, and, think, and think about how I would have done that. When you add sound to your zooms in the 12th century, you have one particular problem um, that really makes things difficult. And that is that the, uh, the church essentially was in charge of book production. And it's only and actually in the course of the, of the 12th century and in the late 12th and 13th century that this begins to break down and that you begin to have uh, scribes which are hired out for pay and are no longer members of uh, monastic or cathedral scriptoria. And so you begin in the 13th century in earnest to have, um, to have collections of music which is, has vernacular texts and which is um, music for secular purposes and apart from the church. So the other problem, of course, with music uh, at the Shrine of St. James in the 12th century is that we have this wonderful book, but we don't have all the sounds that surround this book that we assume must have been there. If we study, for example, um, Sicily, where in this same period, uh, at the court of Roger II, um, artists were working in tandem from different styles. And you have Greeks, and, and you have people who are um, Muslim, and you have Christians. And you can see their different decorative styles, both in manuscripts and in some um, documents, and also in architecture. And then you look at, the, at, you, you look at the liturgical manuscripts of that same court, and they are all straight up Anglo-Norman, French, liturgical pieces. There's nothing uh, of a blend about them. So we have something of this uh, going on with the Codex Calixtinus. That just by way of, uh, of introduction. Music plays a major role in this codex. And as a matter of fact, um, you can think of it to a degree as a book that has been created to uh, uh, give great authority to what's happening liturgically and musically at the shrine. Music is only found in the first and at the very end of the book but still, it's referenced throughout the entire work. If we look at the main um, books of the Codex Calixtinus, and you've been hearing a lot about this if you've gone to some of the other talks, I, I don't want to repeat material that you probably know very well, but you do know that it's a, a 12th century book <clears throat> made in two campaigns. So we're talking you know, around 11, in the 1130s, and then again, 11, you know, late 1160s, 1170, for these two campaigns. Um, this first uh, book is loaded with liturgical materials. But then even when you look at the miracles, you'll find that many of them um, have references to liturgical happenings and that there are actually um, pieces put in context in the miracle literature itself. So the miracles are a way of also privileging 
the contexts, uh, I mean the contents uh, of the book, the liturgical uh, contents. The sermons too, of course, are liturgical. Once again, um, they're going to help us with that, uh, that feast for the, for the translation of James' uh, body. Turpin's account of Charlemagne um, mentions all kinds of uh, geographical features that will give great uh, prominence to the, to the church and to its miracle um, literature and provide a history. It's a wonderful history-making epic poem as it appears in this, in this book of the manuscript. And then the Pilgrim's Guide. What an extraordinary thing that is for people who are interested in music and liturgy. I mean, it's really the only thing that goes through and describes the church blow by blow so that um, people who come get a sense of what they're supposed to see, even if they can't see it all as, as clearly as they might like to see it. And then we have this other collection of musical works, which is so important and really shows uh, the collection in many ways to be cutting edge um, for music in the, in the 12th century. And some of, the, uh, some of the first examples of particular kinds of music that we find in all of Europe, we find in this manuscript. So it's an extraordinarily important um, source for, for people who study music. The musical materials, just to look a little bit closer so that you can see the great extensiveness of them. We have this, uh, this feast of, of James, of course, the main feast, uh, the 25th of July, and it's a vigil. But then you have a full octave. So every day after this feast, there's music for celebration. Uh, then the Feast of the Translation, mentioned that earlier, that's a whole nother full complex of feasts. And then there is this particular feast that could be said every day, and we know from material in the Codex that they did say uh, a Mass for St. James every day there. So there were special prayers and offerings every single day, no matter what time uh, of the year you happen to show up. Um, on the steps of that church, you would be able to find special liturgical material for the patron saint. And then, of course, too, um, an attempt to add this Feast of Miracles. That would have been October 3rd. That We're not sure it ever really happened. And then the later material as well. So um, I thought, for the sake of time, to uh, look at four different pieces, each of which will um, give us uh, some different aspects of the music so that you can see the great variety that's in it. Um, this is a famous quotation, and I just put it up there for you. It's a quotation which, which describes all of the different pilgrims that come and how they all sing in different languages, in different playing styles. Um, and it's one of the most important thematic tropes of the entire uh, codex. And that is that everybody's there, everybody's present. People have come to this place um, from all over Europe to celebrate and to be together. And so if we look at the various themes of the book, um, and you'll find them in the texts, we'll see that to be one of them. I listed it last. It is a major trope, presence of peoples of all types, music and celebration of the work of pilgrims. And that's a particular way, of course, not only to make people feel welcome, but also to enhance the importance uh, of the shrine as a place for pilgrims to come. Then the different authorities of the saint. Um, the materials in the codex have this as a primary goal to establish his authority. And they do that by constant reference to his appearance in the Bible, both the calling of James and his brother, and that's John, by Jesus and their appellation, Sons of Thunder. Um, the presence of James, and that was mentioned this morning at the Transfiguration. So he's one of the, of the uh, people who's present at this miraculous event. And that has a lot to do with being able to see and understand and prophesy history and the future. And then his miraculous powers. And of course, it's important that they're established not only in Compostela, but other places as well. If you go away and you pray to him, um, you'll, have, you'll have particular kinds of power. So as we look at these particular four pieces that I've chosen, each one in a different style, let's think about how these themes actually show up. I've chosen an offertory, 
a sequence, a polyphonic benedicamus, and a pilgrim's song. So, in a sense, we go from the um, most ancient kind of music to uh, a piece which is particular to the 12th century, a pilgrim song like this. Um, and each one of these pieces have their own particular problems for performance. Here's the text for the offertory of St. James. Going up into the mountain, Jesus called to him James of the Zebedee and John the brother of James and gave them the name Boangeres, that is, the sons of thunder. For truly your arrows, Lord, they fly. The voice of your thunder is all around. Um, you can see here the text from St. Mark, which uh, is a gospel that would have been read at the feast. Um, and the style is in Gregorian chant. Um, it's a piece that has a very different sound to our ear, both in the way the text is constructed and the way the music is constructed. Um, and it's a mode one piece. That means it centers around D. Uh, it's characteristic in mode one. We you'll hear, have a leap up um, the fifth, and, and you'll hear that happening, leap up to A, and a lot of concentration on the pitch D. I'm going to show you the score and, and also play it for you um, in a performance by uh, Anonymous Four. I think I can just play this off of my off of my iTunes, so if you'll bear with me. We'll look first at the at the photo of it. Here's the opening. You can see um, the style of the music. It's music that's on a stave. It um, is pneumatic. There you have an F clef. Um, so this line is, is going to be F. You have um, no problem reading pitches. You have to make decisions about particular kinds of neumes that are here. And you also have to make decisions about rhythm. But pitch um, is not a problem. You might see my hand there and wonder how it was that I got my hands on this manuscript. Um, I didn't. I was able to scan the facsimile copy at Notre Dame. Many college libraries have wonderful sets of facsimiles. And the Codex Calixtinus is completely available in a beautiful facsimile, which uh, allows you to study it almost as if you're touching the real thing, even though, of course, you're not. So I'll, um, I'll let you look at that for a little bit while I go into my iTunes. It's great to be a teacher now when you have all of your, all of your life on display for your students to see. My students recently said to me, Fast, they all call me Fast, they said, Fast, you've been, you've been watching Gay Sassy Friend on YouTube. I said, yeah, I was watching it. So you can see I have a lot of anonymous four. And this is the uh, recording I very much recommend. So we'll hear some sounds, uh, and we get to hear women's voices, and then we get to hear men's voices. And that makes some, for some variety um, in the work that we're doing.
Now, you can hear a lot of uh, the style of this piece. It's flowing. Particular words are going to be emphasized by long melismas. That is one particular set of notes on, on a vowel. So you can see how thunder gets a long melisma and is particularly emphasized in this text. Sometimes the text will just be declaimed, as in uh, this phrase right here, for example. Just a lot of declaiming. So there's a great variety in this, in this style of Gregorian chant. Um, some of the other pieces we'll hear have other features, but this one is the only one in this particular style that I'm, that I'm going to play, although it is the most common style of the uh, musical repertory of the uh, Codex Calistinus. Whoops, sorry, that should be it. E. That's it. This piece is a sequence, and its form is completely different uh, from the form of the piece that we uh, just listened to. A sequence is a long chant that is sung just before uh, this, the intoning of the gospel at mass. So it provides for you um, a kind of vita or statement about a saint's life in the heart of the mass liturgy. And that's what you, that's what we, what you get here. And um, I thought I'd read just a little bit of this piece to you so that you can see that the vita of St. James, which is so important, is being proclaimed in the Mass. We give thanks with most joyful praise. Happily and merrily, Spain rejoices. Dear and glorious James shines in victory, who today rose up, crowned with celestial glory. James of the Zebedee and his blessed brother John were called by the Savior on the Sea of Galilee. They diligently spread to everyone their faith in the Holy Trinity, preaching the true word in Judea. James, strong in grace, gave witness to the law. He shows Christ to all ages and to every part of the world. If the time were a little bit longer, um, I could show you how all of those themes that I listed um, on that early slide are present, actually, in this sequence. So when we think of a saint's vita, we don't just think of it as something that's read. We also see, think of it as something that's sung, and sung not only in the office or hours of prayer, but via the sequence also um, to be found in the Mass Liturgy. I'll play just a tiny bit of it for you. Now look how different that notation is from the piece that you saw before. So many different ways it's a different kind of piece. It is, first of all, syllabic. You don't find words lifted out and emphasized by melismas in a piece like this. And the form is completely different. It's very repetitive in that you have these double versicles. It's through composed. That is to say, it's not like a hymn where you would have the same music for each successive strophe of text. But instead, you have these paired versicles. And perhaps you can see them. Another thing that you have in this piece are words added in other languages. Um, and this, you have Greek, you have Hebrew, you have ways of, of making the text have a particular authority. And so you can see them written in uh, the, the Latin translation of these, of these mystical words. As I said, I'll play just a tiny bit of it. I think I made the bad mistake of closing my iTunes by mistake. Now, are you noticing something that's not in the music? 
They're adding a, 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 a droning sound, anonymous four is, to this piece. And that's because there are other pieces in, in this style, in this particular manuscript. So not only is the syllabic style of the music completely different, but also the rendering of it is a different kind of performance as well. ceremony. <laughs> this piece is the most famous piece in the entire Codex Calixtinus. It comes from that late fascicle, and it is the earliest three-voice piece of polyphony that survives from all of medieval Europe. That is, if it is indeed a three-voice piece. Now, you can see here again that we're looking at something quite different. We're looking actually um, at polyphonic voices. We're looking at three voices. And you can see that you have one voice added in red. You have one voice here, where my pointer is, another voice here, and then the voice in red. So the question is, do you play the voice down here with one of those voices only at one time? Or do you play both with that other voice at the same time? And when you play all three together, you get um, a great amount of dissonance. So what you're going to hear when Lionheart plays it is an experiment. We've gone now into the realm of, of music where you can see how many different choices performers have to make when they deal with the music in the Codex Calixtinus, especially with the pieces that were added in this last uh, fascicle or grouping of around 20 pieces. So you're going to hear the following things. They will first sing the one single voice. They will then sing it with the other voice in black notation. They will then sing it with the voice in red notation. They will then sing, when they perform this piece, all three voices together. So you'll hear it four times. And then you'll hear that twice. And I don't know, if we had an applauseometer or something, we could take a poll uh, to see what you think. But it is, with so much of medieval music, an incredibly creative thing for um, a performer to, to render this music. Not only, of course, to, to know what to do with the voices, but also, we don't have a problem with the pitches, we have a problem with how many voices to sing at once, but we then have a serious problem as to what to do with rhythm. So you can hear any number of performances, ways of grouping these voices, ways of looking at, at how to proclaim this text and how to make the text come to life, and the choices are all up to the performer through study, through thinking about the text, through thinking about the possibilities. And so, of course, listen to, um, to hear uh, what Lionheart does with this piece. The last piece I'm going to talk about, I have four minutes left, is probably what I would call the funkiest piece um, in the Codex Calixtinus. Look at this piece. First of all, 
What can you tell me about it? Is the text different? The hand? Yes. And how about the notation? Yes, it's Aquitanian notation. It's not French news. Also, what happens to our ease of reading? Kind of goes out the window. Pictures aren't quite so uh, easy to discern, although they are discernible. What's the other thing that happens? Not, uh, if, you, if you compare, it's, it's a strophic piece. There's a lot of repetition in it. If you compare it, you'll find um, that, it, uh, that the music is slightly different each time you get a repetition. And then after the scribe, in his ear and in his mind, writes out a few different versions of it and puts in different, slightly different ways that he knows of singing this piece, he then gives up and stops. So then, of course, uh, the performer has to decide which version to take and what to do. Now, the text of this piece, which I have for you, my last two minutes, tells you something really interesting about the Codex Calixtinus and its music. It many times has features that make us think, is this a piece? Are these pieces that were written to teach people how to sing, it has, it sort of smells of a chalkboard. It sort of makes us think of the schoolroom. And instead of messing around with the Latin in my last one minute, we'll go down here. And you can see what happens with this refrain. Every time that James is called upon in the Latin, he's called upon in a different case. So, and I mean, those of you who have studied this music know this, this is, you know, a well-known thing. But it's, it's so interesting and it's so wonderful that um, we begin with, with James the nominative. And then we have James the genitive, James the dative, James the accusative, James the vocative, and James in the ablative. So there's a lot of... Um, of good-natured humor in this book, in its music, and in its piety. Um, and so I think that's an important thing for us to notice as we think about how to perform it and how to understand it um, and how to be with these pilgrims um, of then and of now as well. Thank you. <laughs>